even trying to speak to you now, it's so loud around us. So maybe that's, that's the point, so that they can uh, deliver their message as loudly as possible. And do you think they'll be heard? I mean, it's completely detached almost to what is happening over there. COP26 was billed as the last best chance to save the planet. Many of the world's most powerful leaders, climate scientists and activists descended on Glasgow with an aim to do just that. But how successful have they been? And is what's happened inside this conference centre really going to solve our climate emergency? The negotiations are more formal process. Behind closed doors, it's difficult to understand what's happening in the conference. Sam Meredith is a correspondent for CNBC, covering climate, health and international politics. He's been in Glasgow for the duration of COP26, writing about the stories both inside and outside the conference centre. How has COP26 gone? Yeah, OK, so I think it's important to say that in the run-up to the summit, expectations were very low and they were actually made lower by world leaders and diplomats. Part of the problem for COP26, I suppose, is that there's gonna be no headline agreement that comes out of this. This COP is about determining whether the Paris Agreement from six years ago is fit for purpose. The 2015 Paris Climate Agreement committed countries to limit global warming to no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, with an aim for one and a half degrees. But climate scientists say that one and a half degrees Celsius needs to be more than just an aim. They say if global average temperatures rise by more than that, the Earth will likely experience more extreme climate change effects, such as an increased risk of drought and flooding. I don't get a sense that a lot of people are talking about 1.5. Why is that? Yeah, well, it depends which people you're referring to, I suppose. I think if it's low-income leaders, we saw the Barbados Prime Minister, for example, Mia Motley, delivering a very powerful speech. 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence. Global warming already stands at 1.1 degrees Celsius and is rising. And despite countries' targets for decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, the world is still on track for a 2.4 degree warming by the end of the century. So what came out of the COP26 negotiations? The Glasgow Climate Pact, which was agreed on by 197 members. It's the first ever climate deal to explicitly plan to reduce coal, the worst fossil fuel for greenhouse gases. It also resolved to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to that all-important 1.5 degrees Celsius. While each country's climate commitments are not legally binding, negotiations around specific words carried on well past the deadline. In the end, there was disappointment that countries agreed that instead of phasing out coal, they would phase down, following opposition from China and India. I apologise for the way this process has unfolded, um, and uh, I am deeply sorry. The start of the conference was a lot more upbeat, following a flurry of wide-reaching pre-arranged pledges that created a buzz to kick off proceedings. Significant ones include pledges by the world's biggest CO2 emitters, the US and China, to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal. The US also announced a partnership with the EU and like-minded parties to cut global methane emissions from 2020 levels by 30% before the end of the decade. More than 20 countries made new commitments to phase out coal power, and India pledged to cut its emissions to net zero by 2070. India is an interesting example because it is not historically as responsible as others for the climate crisis. So there is less onus on it as such to commit to more stringent goals that you might expect other rich countries to do so. It can and possibly should do more, um, but it's a significant development for them to commit to 2070. India argued that other developing countries still have to deal with their development agendas and poverty eradication before phasing out coal and fossil fuels. In particular, it led calls for richer nations to provide financial aid for emerging markets to deal with climate change. I think a key test will be finance. This was uh, imperative to rebuilding trust uh, between the countries in the global north and those in the global south. So in 2009, in Copenhagen at COP15, we had rich countries pledging to deliver $100 billion a year by 2020. And of course, we're still not there with rich countries delivering that $100 billion. That's a big problem for repairing trust. We're not expected for that to be delivered until 2023. 
And it was also a largely symbolic figure anyway, because the real cost of what it will take to transition to net zero will be trillions. While a number of richer countries promised more funds for climate finance, the US and the EU resisted calls from developing countries to create a funded facility for climate disaster victims over fears of incurring billions in damages. The pledges made so far also fall short of capping temperature rises below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Based on the real-world action of current policies, temperatures will rise by 2.7 degrees. If nationally determined contribution targets for 2030 are fully implemented, then temperatures are estimated to rise by 2.4 degrees. If alongside that all long-term targets were fulfilled, then it would drop to around 2.1 degrees. And even in the unlikely event there is a full implementation of every target ever announced, the best case scenario is a temperature rise of 1.8 degrees Celsius. Delegates did however agree to set tougher climate pledges before the COP27 meeting in Egypt next year. While critics accuse the member states of kicking the climate can down the road, others say that countries would not have had to resubmit new climate commitments until 2025 under the Paris Agreement. So any agreement to ratchet up action within 12 months would be a big win. What's been the opinion of business leaders here at COP26 on what's been agreed? I'm sure they've been watching quite closely. Yeah, of course. Um, well, on Finance Day at COP, we saw the former Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, who's also a UN special envoy on climate, announce GFANS, so many acronyms at COP. This was yet another one. It's the Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero. Just about got it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this uh, initiative, he says, mobilised $130 trillion from financial institutions and asset managers to net zero commitments. That sounds like a lot of money. It's around 40% of the world's capital, which, again, seems like a, a big deal. Critics of this, though, suggest that there are too many loopholes for this to be uh, an effective solution to meet the demands of the climate emergency. However, climate activists outside the conference centre are not convinced that COP26, or more summits for that matter, will bear any real fruits. Rather than voluntary contributions, they are calling for regulation and enforcement, and accuse businesses of greenwashing. This is no longer a climate conference. This is now a Global North Greenwash Festival. Leading youth climate activist Greta Thunberg wasn't invited to COP26 and many critics of the conference argue there haven't been enough young people to put pressure on the decision makers. I really expected there to be uh, many more young people than we've seen. Particularly when all the protests, climate protests, tend to be led by young people. Exactly. I think that's been really noticeable, particularly in the, the main hub of the event where lots of the world leaders are based. There were a couple particularly moving speeches. There was one from an environmental advocate from Samoa. Her name was Brianna Fruin. This is our warrior cry to the world. We are not drowning, we are fighting. We also heard from an indigenous Amazonian activist. Her name was Shai Suri. My father, the great chief Almis Rui, taught me that we must listen to the stars, the moon, the wind, the animals and the trees. I spoke to a spokesperson for the COP26 coalition, which is a civil society group that represents communities from the global south and they've described this event uh, as one of the most exclusionary that they've known. They feel that they've been locked out of the talks and even when it comes to accessing these talks remotely, there have been problems online as well, which I know that the UN has apologised for, so it's, it's been a problem. What would a really successful COP26 have looked like? It's really difficult to define what a successful summit would look like, but the pledges that we'd seen, uh, particularly at the start of the summit, gave some reason for optimism. Uh, some of the experts that I'd spoken to had talked about their expectations being surpassed. You have to think, if you're trying to be optimistic about this, that there is hope here, but we can't know yet. And we need to look at it through that skeptical lens because there have been past commitments which have not lived up to their billing. So it's very hard to think that all the countries that ratified the Paris Agreement six years ago can leave Glasgow knowing that they've done all they could to keep 1.5 alive.